All right, everyone. I am here with Jesse Engel. Jesse is a staff research scientist at Google. Jesse, welcome to the Twimmel AI podcast. Thank you very much for having me. Hey, I'm really looking forward to our conversation. We're going to be talking about the Magenta Project and uh, creativity and how that relates to artificial intelligence. Uh, But to get us started, I'd love to hear a little bit about your background and how you came to combine what I imagine are these amazing passions of yours, music and creativity and artificial intelligence. Yeah, thanks. Um, I actually took a rather strange route to to where I am. Uh, I did an undergrad in physics, and then I did a PhD in actually material science and nanotechnology. So I worked on solar cells, um, and then I shifted over into computational neuroscience for a postdoc in electrical engineering, working in uh, neuromorphic engineering. And then I finally, from that, uh, did what I, I think of as my second postdoc, but I, I worked at the um, helping to start the Silicon Valley AI lab with Baidu uh, and Andrew Ng. So we worked there on speech recognition. Okay. Uh, so I sort of got all my deep learning chops together. Um, and then uh, I found out through some friends that um, Doug Eck was starting a group in Google Brain called Magenta focused on creativity and music. And I seemed like a great fit for me because um, simultaneous to all that, I'm also sort of a semi-professional guitarist and musician. So I've always looked for ways to try to combine the science, the hard science and the, and the music. Uh, and this just looked like a great opportunity. So I joined the group about four and a half years ago. Um, and yeah, now I'm just the, the research lead on the group and sort of helping us uh, push forward on new projects. That's awesome. I had the pleasure of meeting Doug and interviewing him. This is back in 2017 uh, at a, I think we were at a conference in New York City. Um, uh, Great interview. We'll link to it in the show notes. Uh, So I imagine that he must be fun to work with. Yeah, Doug's uh, Doug's definitely a character. I think that's one of the, (laughs) one of the joys of the, uh, the project in general, just, I love the the people I work with are really, are really fun. Um, and so it's, he gives a lot of free freedom in terms of what you decide to actually work on. So I, so I really appreciate that. Nice. And so how are you using that freedom? Tell us a little bit about the things that you're working on. Yeah. So um, when I came in, the Magenta sort of had a bit of a, we, we had a sort of vaguely defined uh, research goal, which was sort of to investigate um, how machine learning can be useful in computational creativity. Um, but we sort of focused in a bit more thinking about beyond just whether or not this amorphous question of can computers be creative or not to rather focus on, well, what do we want to use computers for in this next generation of assistive technologies for creativity? So um, basically how can, what's the role that machine learning has to play in the creative process. Um, and because there's always been the way we look at it, there's always been this coevolution between technology and creativity, you know, the tools that we use to express ourselves and the ways that we express ourselves, um, especially in music. So things like the development of even the piano back in the day to allow, um, for playing notes at different, um, uh, different loudnesses and, uh, equal mm-hmm. temperament to play in all 12 keys or like the development of the 808, uh, you know, uh, synthesized drums, which were supposed to be realistic, but actually ended up uh, being unrealistic in really great ways, such that it became the staple sound of hip hop and electronica and all these things. So there's been this long evolution of, um, you know, electricity and then uh, 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 computers and all these different things with music. And so we sort of say, there's a lot of advancements happening with deep learning and machine learning. And so we wanted to look at Um, how can we use these technologies and how can we design them in such a way that people's creative agency and empowerment is actually enhanced by this? So rather than replacing people with sort of just uh, algorithms that generate music for people to listen to, how can we make the process of making music uh, more compelling and more accessible um, to people of all different skill levels? Mm. And what is the current landscape of computer-aided creativity or more pointedly AI-aided creativity look like? Yeah, so um, a lot of machine learning models, um, there's a lot of uh, research models are focused on um, sort of just generating realistic outputs um, and uh, sort of think of it along these three axes. Uh, There's sort of the axis of expressivity, like how Mm -hmm. realistic uh, are are the, the controls that I have, you know, how 
expressive can it be? Um, and then interactivity in terms of uh, what's in order to learn to do something and uh, to learn to use something to, to make stuff, you really want to have uh, feedback loops that are short so that you can iterate, you know, on using it much, uh, a lot. Um, so that's like uh, low latency generation and having controls that are actually semantically meaningful. And then the third is adaptability. So if I want to hack this in some new way, I want to bring my own data to the situation. I want to change this tool to be my own. How do I do that? Um, and so there's been a lot of uh, advancements in the past few years. Um, like if we look specifically in the context of music, which I'm going to talk a lot about because um, some of us are musicians and we just really like the domain of music. So um, a lot of our algorithms have focused there. Um, also just because it's a great place to uh, experiment with creativity without having to worry about, um, you know, uh, spitting out uh, words that might be offensive to different groups. I mean, offensive sounds are, you know, uh, a little bit less uh, uh, constantly, different contextually issue. polarized. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so basically, models typically fall into uh, a couple different uh, buckets of how they approach the problem. You can approach, you can approach the problem of modeling music as just the sound waveform itself. So if I'm trying to predict you know, what is the actual shape of this wave that I'm going to play back on my computer and listen to? Um, and so that's like the lowest level of representation. Uh, but you can also think about um, more semantically meaningful chunks of information for people. So like when people play music, they don't draw the waveforms individually. They play notes on a guitar or a piano or, um, or a synthesizer or, or something like that. Um, and so uh, there's another approach we call symbolic, uh, the symbolic modeling, which is if you have some sort of uh, tokenized version of the music that's going by. So like, what are the notes that are being played? What are the drum hits that are being played? Um, how much time passes in between each of these notes? And then you model that as a language stream, just very similar to how a language model would you know, model uh, text as a series of tokens. Um, and so there's been a lot of developments in the, in the past uh, few years in these, uh, you know, some some very high profile, high profile work from um, uh, from our group. We've done some things in symbolic uh, modeling, such as uh, the music transformer work, which was like looking at you know one of the first works applying music um, these these new transformer models to the symbolic domain. Um, OpenAI has done some some really impressive work in terms of. Um, both the symbolic and also the raw waveform uh, with their jukebox model, sort of modeling um, uh, the yeah, evolution of these raw waveforms and then just training on really large data sets. Um, I think what's really interesting though is to see also how um, people have been looking at expanding beyond just that basic question of, can I just train a generative model, but rather to say, um, how do I make this model actually useful to people? How do I make the conditioning signal something that someone would actually want to control, you know, and, and be able to express themselves in, in a really interesting way. So um, I'm proud of some of the work we've done. Uh, there's this project called uh, DDSP, which is Differentiable Digital Signal Processing. Um, and the idea there is really just focusing on if we're going to generate raw waveforms, what are other higher level representations of the signal that we can expose to people such that... Um, they can they can feel more agency over the control of the situation. You know, you can you can really uh, manipulate all the fine scale detail of what's going on, um, and do it in an interactive and extremely fast to generate kind of way. So it's actually much more like a real instrument as opposed to a you know iterative like okay I'm going to try my idea and now I'm going to synthesize on a GPU for you know 16 hours and see what that see what the output is. <laughs> you know that doesn't sound quite as rewarding. <laughs> well, it's just a different process. It's, um, it's you know, sort of, you know, it's, it, I think there's a continuum between painting and dancing, the way I like to think of it. Dancing is this very uh, real-time thing, or maybe choreography and dancing is maybe another way of thinking about it, mm -hmm. you know, that um, you are you building an artifact at the end of the day, or are you building something that you interact with as a process? You know, is this a noun, like a thing that I'm making, or is this a verb in terms of, like, is this a, a thing that I can do? Um, am I building tools that enable me to do new things? And so that's just, you know, it's just a spectrum and each project sort of falls, depending on how fast it is and how expressive it is, it falls in different spots on that spectrum. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit more about uh, DDSP. Um, what are the the representations? Like, what does that end up uh, looking like? Um, you know, when you're 
uh, trying to represent music in this more meaningful way? Yeah, sure. Um, so if you take um, some of the, the popular initial models of generating actual waveforms um, or things like WaveNet uh, and all the, the different variations of that, like WaveRNN and SampleRNN and all these things, um, Jukebox is another version of that, where you're actually drawing the individual waveform. The model is predicting, given the last waveform samples I've seen, what's the next waveform sample that I'm going to see? Um, but the thing is that you don't actually hear what you hear is not actually uh, a one-to-one -one mapping to what a waveform looks like. There are many different waveforms that all look uh, different, but sound exactly the same to your ear. Um, and so there's a lot of interesting psychoacoustics that happens there where, um, let's say I just take um, a couple of sinus. That, yeah. Is that related to like the, you know, proper properties of the ear in terms of filter, you know, filter, you know, high pass filter, low pass filter, that kind of thing. Or are there other relationships between different waveforms that have them render to the ear the same, um, the same way? Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of different biophysical models of, of how hearing works, <laughs> um, for sure. But like, it's uh, surprising how um, good, of a first approximation thinking about things in terms of frequencies actually is. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so it's that's sort of a um, thinking of things in terms of when you say a frequency by necessity sort of thinks about a sinusoidal basis, you know, in terms yeah. of like, what are this orthogonal basis of sine waves that I can add together to, to give back uh, a waveform. And what's interesting is the ear and your mind connected to the ear, right, are very sensitive to certain uh, to the, the phase of the, of uh, the sine waves, um, but only at certain, in, in certain types of relationships. So it's, so like when, a uh, at impulses, like if I'm going, you know, bah, the b part of it is something where ever things are really changing. And so at that transient point, you need all those sine waves to line up in just the right way, such that, mm -hmm. uh, such that it sounds like a buh instead of some other type of syllable. But then for the for the singing part where I'm where I'm vocalizing with a relatively steady state signal, your ear is actually very uh, uh, insensitive to the absolute uh, phase relationships of the of the sine waves because um, it's more important to be just extracting out. Okay, is you know what's the frequencies that are present? Um, so yeah, so it's, it is that thing. Your ear to first approximation is doing some sort of frequency decomposition mm -hmm. of the of the signal. And so we take that idea, um, and the the thought about DDSP is that uh, the you know these really large uh, WaveNet models um, they they're sufficient, but maybe not necessary. You know, you can model the waveform sample by sample, but we can we know a lot of prior information about digital signal processing and about perception. So maybe we can incorporate those in together, so we can make things much more efficient. So the neural network doesn't have to learn the stuff that we already know. So in that case, um, you can look at generating uh, using some very simple signal processing components. So things like sinusoidal oscillators or filters or room reverberation modules and these types of things. Um, and so you take a complicated neural network and you control the simple oscillator components with that complicated neural network. And so what happens is even though each of those components just like I'm saying, what's the frequencies and the amplitudes of a bunch of different sine waves? So that's like a sinusoidal model. And even though that's a very um, simple model of audio, if I can modulate those amplitudes and those frequencies with a lot of detail based by a neural network saying that, um, then I can actually get very expressive audio out that actually sounds uh, pretty realistic. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the basis behind the uh, initial experiments with these models was to um, ba basically back, back propagate through that whole process. So we implement all these digital signal processing things in TensorFlow um, mm -hmm. so that we can actually take the gradient of, we produce some, uh, some audio as the output, and then we look at the frequency alignment of the audio as the output to um, the target audio. So we're making sort of like an auto encoder type of framework where we're encoding some target audio and then decoding it into these sinusoidal representations. And also, um, things that aren't sinusoidal. So we also have some like uh, noise components like filter noise and then uh, allow for a room response. So you sort of have these uh, separate modules that are all 
actually quite interpretable. You know, you're like, oh yeah, I see the frequencies that are present here and I can manipulate them individually. Um, as opposed to, well, I just put in some input and I just got some output back out and I don't know what's going on in the interior of the model. So um, yeah, so it's that idea of having uh, intermediate uh, differentiable operations that are also um, uh, interpretable and being able to then use those to resynthesize the outputs in an efficient, uh, in an efficient and modular kind of way. Mm -hmm. and, and so you've got this encoder decoder type model and you, you've got your, your target audio coming in and your synthesized audio going out. Is the goal to, you know, through a training process to uh, make those more similar uh, and if that's the case, where does the creative aspect uh, come in? Or is this part of a bigger system for enabling creativity? Yeah, that's that's a great question, right? Because an autoencoder in and of itself is not very creative, right? <laughs> so it's like, yeah, okay, fine, you, you have a code of it. A MP3. creative destruction, I guess, is a thing. Yeah. But yeah. Right. <laughs> I mean, MP3 is also encode and decode, right? But we don't think of them as a creative tool, right? Right. Um, but the difference is if I just gave you the bit stream of an MP3, you wouldn't really know what to do with that. You're like, I don't know, maybe I'll turn some of these ones to zeros and see what happens. Mm -hmm. um, but what we can do is we can structure these autoencoders in such a way such that the inputs and the outputs actually mean something to people. Mm -hmm. So we can take, uh, let's say, a musical instrument like a violin, and we can just extract out things that are actually semantically meaningful about it, like what is the pitch that is being played and what is the, the loudness of the signal. Um, so even just taking those two quantities um, and then feeding those as the encoding into the autoencoder, and then having a decode to the synthesizer properties to reconstruct the sound. Then we can start to play some really interesting games because then we can say, well, what if we took the pitch and the loudness of a different signal, like my voice or my guitar or something like that, and then we'll feed that into the system um, and then decode it with this decoder that was trained on a different instrument, like a violin. And so then what we get is this very natural a transformation of the tone. So everything, the pitch is, remains the same because the pitch was an interpretable quantity and the loudness remains the same. Um, but the tone is uh, completely transferred and, and changed from one instrument to another. So we've developed some um, demonstrations of that that are kind of fun. Um, and uh, so if you go to g.co slash tone transfer, you'll actually see um, a nice uh, web demo that allows you to do exactly that and yeah, has some some good examples. And you can transfer to like a couple different instruments. We have like a violin and a flute and a saxophone. Um, and then there's, you know, some collab notebooks associated with the, the DDSP code base that you can actually train your own models on your own instruments. Um, but that whole web experience is enabled by the fact that the neural networks can actually be quite small because so much of the function that it's learning is actually by these uh, these d these DSP components. Mm -hmm. So we can actually get down things down to just um, uh, compressing models to even smaller than one megabyte, right? And running in your web browser in real time. Wow. Um, and so that's like something that we'd never be able to do with a raw waveform model. Um, and we have some follow up work we're doing to actually make a an interactive plugin for people in their. Um, uh, so if you use professional music software, they, there's this format called a VST plug, and then everyone just uses it. You drop it into your music software, and then you can play around with this this type of um, this basically this this piece of software. So we're we're having a real time plugin for these DSP things that we've been developing too. Oh, wow. So it's those type of opportunities that are enabled by having both uh, the strong priors that make things efficient, but also then interpretable, so that people can try out sort of creative ways of uh, manipulating them. Huh. Are there are there elements of the kind of traditional DSP toolkit that you are that aren't that don't lend themselves to differentiation, and therefore you couldn't include them in in what you uh, produced, and you know therefore what what constraints did that uh, result in in your in your model and how it's used. Like, for example, I don't imagine that this necessarily applies to, you know, on an instrument by instrument basis, like, well, you know, flutes really need X, Y, Z thing in a DSP toolkit. And that's hard to do. So we could never do this with flutes or we can't yet do this with flutes. Is there, you know, something in there that you relate to? <laughs> sure. 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 Um, well, in terms of like, 
I think that you can actually get for an individual source, you can actually get a pretty good like spanning basis with um, sinusoids, noise for the things that aren't periodic. And then also you also need like a, a transient model to be able to just handle those, 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 like I was saying, those, those transient moments um, that aren't steady state. Um, but one of the things that doesn't, um, that's not differentiable is we have all these little modules, right? But we, we have to sort of assign ahead of time how to wire them all up together, right? Um, that we can think of a bunch of different, um, you know, this is just one a type of synthesis called additive synthesis. We could also, there's a whole bunch of, there's wavetable synthesis and subtractive synthesis. And, you know, there's uh, granular synthesis. There's all these different types of approaches that people have developed by hand um, that you can implement differentiably. But uh, some of the more interesting larger components, especially for multi-instrument situations and stuff, um, with with uh, when you when you want to make something differentiable, you kind of have to allow the system to explore all possible options at once. Um, so you have to you have to enable every possible routing path, and then backpropagate through that that soft weighting of all those possible paths. But that quickly becomes uh, intractable if you really want to combine because it's combinatorial. All the different ways you could combine stuff. So I think there's some interesting opportunities available for you know, RL or other gradient-free methods, um, you know, like uh, evolutionary algorithms and stuff, looking at just trying lots of different sub-modules and how do I route all these sub-modules together in a creative way, such as to um, better model and output. Um, and even if it's not better model and output, I think you could get really creative in terms of the the sounds that would come out because of um, the biases built into the sub-modules themselves. So, mm -hmm. uh I haven't had time to do any of those projects, but I hope someday someone does. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about the training process and training data that you use as part of this project? Sure. Um, yeah. So this uh, we've we've been looking at polyphonic extensions, which means multiple instruments and multiple notes. But for this initial model, there is a lot of bias. Unlike another, unlike a typical neural network where it just goes to the raw waveform there's no internal assumptions about like, it's not an object oriented model just by itself. So it doesn't have any thoughts about how many sources might be present at a time. Uh, but this, uh, the way we, it, yeah. just to kind of replay that, are, sure. it, are you, are you saying essentially that is only kind of frequencies in, and it's not thinking at higher levels in terms of instruments, or are you saying something different? Um, I'm, I'm saying, so the, um, that there's certain relationships uh, between the frequencies that um, they're uh, basically, uh, if you go back to physics, it's kind of interesting that uh, most things when you hit them and they vibrate can be pretty well approximated by a second order differential equation. And the mm -hmm. solutions to those happen to turn out to be harmonic oscillations. So mm -hmm. uh, things vibrate in a, if, when they're vibrating elastically, they vibrate in a harmonic way such that the, the frequencies with which they vibrate are integer multiples of each other, more or less. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's this object, there's this no notion of like an object that's sort of built into the DS DSP models at the moment in the sense that we're training models that have these certain harmonic relationships to a fundamental frequency. So that that building uh, off of a single fundamental frequency is like that's the object, and the, and that relationships are given by the type of the instrument that it is, um, and so uh, that's both a strength in the sense that uh, the value of object oriented machine learning is that you can then do all these sort of better generalization things in terms of manipulating these objects, but it's also a weakness in the sense that if you try to model anything that doesn't satisfy those assumptions, like oh actually there's two instruments playing at once. The system's not going to know what to do with it. You know, you have to then you have to then adapt to that. So uh, I don't remember the original question, but I, I, I was thinking of something about the limitations of the system, maybe, and, or yeah. is training of it. But that was the thing. Training. So we're training on um, individual instruments. Um, so uh, as opposed to full band arrangements or you know other other types of things. Um, so what's nice though, is, uh, when you do have an individual instrument, um, since it's so efficient, it requires relatively less training data. So, so a lot of our models are trained only on 10 minutes, 15 minutes of playing, as opposed to a larger model that might require, uh, you know, hours or tens of hours or hundreds of hours of, of music to, to train, just to learn those, those basic, um, lower level, uh, parts of, of the model. 
Um, so that also enables creative uh, ad adapt to uh, makes it more adaptable. Uh, remember my like three, you know, expressive, interpretable, adaptable. And so the adaptable thing comes because like, um, yeah, if you have a friend who plays, like our saxophone model just came from one of our interns who played sax. And it was like, yeah, I'll record 10 minutes of me playing sax. And now we have a model that's sort of a, you know, a him in a model form. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so it's, yeah, uh, those, that's the training uh, is sort of these, a more focused uh, collection, uh, data collection procedure. And is it, is the training ultimately a supervised kind of training or self-supervised or? <laughs> well, so it's an autoencoder. So um, the, which is really to say that it's supervised with its, with itself, right? In the yeah. sense that the, it's um, the audio waveform is a supervision signal, but we can also extract out using other um, methods uh, like those features, like the, the fundamental frequency of the instrument. Um, and then that is, uh, that's another signal that's input in conditioning. So it's a conditional autoencoder, um, depending on how you think of it there. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you train this, you have this model, you've got some parameters that you can manipulate relating to the frequency, uh, the frequencies that the model's picking up. How mm -hmm. do you kind of place that into a user interface or uh, something that someone might want to, you know, might use as part of a creative process. And even have you done that or have you, you do you play this ar around with this in a Jupyter notebook or what have you? Uh, uh, yeah. So uh, absolutely. If you go to, um, if you go to the, the GitHub. So first of all, I didn't really introduce Magenta so much, but Magenta is this uh, research project uh, research group within Google brain uh, that's focused on um, open source research. So everything we do, we have a GitHub, all of our projects and our, and our things are all there. Um, and so if you just search for the Magenta GitHub, you can find that. Um, I think DDSP has its own repo, but you can find all of this stuff just by going to g.co slash magenta slash DDSP. Um, and uh, if you do that, you'll, you'll find there, we have collab notebooks that enable people to do the um, timbre transfer thing or the tone transfer thing I was talking about earlier. So you take some audio in and then you can convert it to different instruments. Um, we made that web experience uh, at g.co slash tone transfer. So you can actually okay. do that without, you know, ever needing a GPU or a, or a, or a collab notebook. Um, we're working on this real-time implementation uh, for professional music software. And we're also looking at other forms of interaction where um, there's sort of this natural analogy here of we're taking these contours and these pitches and these loudnesses. Um, and so there's a lot of natural ways to extract a contour from someone's interaction. You know, it could be, you know, the movement of their hands in a webcam, or it could be um, like they're painting a painting, you know, and then converting those brush strokes uh, into different frequencies and, and loudnesses and things. So uh, we're also exploring some, some fun little um, collaborations in terms of making uh, sort of multimodal forms of interaction where you're like drawing and music comes out. Awesome. Awesome. Mm -hmm. um, the, the broader group, as you mentioned, looks at uh, a variety of modalities, not just music. Can you give us an overview of some of the, uh, the other types of projects that are happening under the Magenta umbrella? Yeah, uh, the uh, Magenta umbrella sort of shifts from from uh, you know <laughs> year to year or six months to six months because it's um, there's a there's a core group of researchers that's about five or six people, and then we do do a lot of collaborations with with folks throughout Brain. Um, so it's sort of also just sort of a landing page for people that do a project um, that that wants to have more of a public facing outreach besides just, you know, has something to do with creativity and, uh, and interaction more than just, um, you know, your, your paper that you submit to NeurIPS and, and there you go, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, some of our earliest work was looking at, um, the space of sketches, um, looking at, um, you know, modeling, uh, vector graphics in terms of, uh, these, these different sketching data sets, um, and sort of some of the image style transfer back in the day. Uh, some of our, our researchers have actually gone and done a lot of work in the the text uh, domain because that's you know NLP is such a happening area. 
Um, so like Adam Roberts, who's a member of the group, was also a, a core member of um, the T5 uh, uh, group that uh, worked on these giant language models. Um, and so we also have a lot of collaborations ongoing in terms of um, how do you better control the outputs of these uh, giant language models in such a way to, you know, enable someone's creativity rather than just, um, you know, generating streams of, of, un, of just text. Um, Cause there's a lot of overlap there between, between that and then um, symbolic music modeling, which is also a, a really large um, section of the research we've done. Um, and so, from that perspective as well, um, part of the thing about music has been one of the things is um, unlike maybe text or images, there's not a lot of uh, properly labeled and accessible data out there. So um, we've also done a lot of work into releasing new data sets, um, like we've worked together with the International Piano Competition to release um, this uh, Maestro data set, which was... Uh, uh, music of people, professional musics, musicians. Uh, it's like a competition, so they're all showing off virtuosically, um, but they're they're playing as, as fast as they can to impress the judges. But we also have the music that they played in the exact notation they're playing on these disclavier pianos. So you have the exact notation of what are the notes that they're playing. And so we were able to use that to train uh, discriminative models that can take audio and predict which notes are being played and then use that to transcribe much larger data sets uh, as a tool um, because those data sets of the, the line notes don't exist. Um, so yeah, so there's sort of this larger system of bootstrapping because then when we transcribe those, then we can train these really large transformer language models on those transcriptions. Mm -hmm. It's sort of like um, if you imagine the internet didn't have any text, it was just all speech, you know, all just people talking on the internet. And you're like, man, I could really train a great language model on this if I just knew what everyone was saying, you know? Yeah. Um, and so that's sort of what music, that's where music's at right now. Um, and we have we have a lot of, um, one of our major projects for the next year is looking at really large, uh, sort of large language model approaches to, um, not just to generation, but more specifically to how do we uncover all of these meaningful uh, notes and, and other representations such as to then make that data, you know, how do we turn that speech of the internet back into text so that everyone can play with it and have a good time. And uh, specifically by uh, using text as an intermediary or by uh, drawing inspiration from language models to more direct representations of music? Yeah, drawing inspiration from um, approaches to transfer learning and self-supervised learning um, directly from, uh, you know, images or directly from text. So how do we transform the audio model, the audio problem into something that more resembles a text problem uh, and then use transfer learning and self-supervision in that domain to take a small amount of labeled data um, that these labels go along with this audio and then fine tune on that to, to then produce a model that can then predict generalize well to, to all of audio. Um, so it's a, it's an interesting problem because there's um, basically just audio waveforms are just really a lot longer. They're, they're, they're really, it's hard to under, uh, understate overstate. It's hard to overstate uh, how, how long a waveform is, you know, 44 kilohertz, just a three minute song is like a million time steps, right? And um, so, but the relevant information inside of that song is like, it's, it's so much sparser than that. So you really wanna find ways of compressing that information into a discrete vocabulary that's uh, much more semantically meaningful. Interesting. And thinking about the parallels between uh, NLP types of models and some of the things that you're doing, uh, and the, the way you're talking about symbolic representation on the NLP side, there's this kind of back and forth between linguistics as a source for thinking about language symbolically to some extent or another and kind of a statistical approach. Does you know, music theory or whatever the right uh, field offer the same kind of relationship uh, to what you're doing? Yeah, exactly. There's this constant push and pull um, between you know, expert prior knowledge, right? You know, you can you can decompose the grammar of music uh, and there's lots of, there's hundreds of years of knowledge to draw from there in terms of how to decompose that grammar. But the problem is those grammars, um, 
you know, often only work in limited situations, right? Limited contexts, and and they have the limits of their expressivity. And so, um, it's you know, the philosophy I think of the group is that um, you don't want to limit yourself by only considering these 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 grammars and this 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 prior knowledge that people know, but but yet if you can contextualize the representations that these large models learn if you can find ways to contextualize them in terms of the representations that people already know. So if I can talk about music um, and put it in the language of music theory as well, or give you conditioning based upon the, the rules of music theory that you know, you know, find a common API between the person and the model, mm. um, then, uh, it's, then it works better for the end goal that you care, which isn't like log likelihood at the end of the day. It's, it's how useful is it for somebody? Um, and it's, you know, the same problem that everyone faces when they try to interface machine learning with the real world. It's, um, you know, if you have a medical diagnosis system, you know, how do you, how do you get it such that people actually want to use that system and doctors trust it? Um, and, um, and, and know when not to trust it, you know, uh, and all these types of things. Um, so it's just nice to get to ask these questions in this context where also no one's life depends on whether or not, <laughs> you know, it's sticking to the key of C major. Yeah. Um, but it's still asking a fundamental question that's very related to AI safety and all of those things. Mm, interesting. What What's the thing that as a musician you most want to see come out of the work you're doing and the work others are doing in this field? That's a great question. Um I, I think it's it, it's funny because it's like as a musician, I'm, I, I can only speak of it as as myself as a musician. You know, like because because yeah. there is so many different things that that people, um, like the way you relate to yourself as a musician is a very personal thing, and it it varies from person to person. So, like you can see that also reflected in the ways that people approach the machine learning research. Um, so, like uh, there's this great group called Databots that's really into just like death metal or not death metal is, but like, you know, gent and other styles, styles of like really intense uh, metal and sort of really into the aesthetic of removing the person from the equation mm. and just like making this thing that just is, is producing this nonstop infinite barrage of, you know, of, <laughs> of metal. And I, I mean, it's great. It's their, it's an aesthetic that has been applied through their work and their research into a final product. Um, my own personal aesthetic comes out of uh, jazz and improvisational music um, and uh, and sort of rhythm-based music and these types of things. So I really look towards how do I create tools that um, do something that that hasn't been done before, but I can also learn how to use. So like when I when I'm playing with these models that make really weird, funny sounds, I'd love to make them interactive because then I can sit down, and play with them for a few hours and like mm -hmm. really layer my prior expertise as a musician on top of that and be able to actually produce um, something new and wild. Um, but I, I think personally in terms of what I find most satisfying, that's, that's like what's satisfying to my ears, but what's most uh, emotionally satisfying is when I see uh, our technologies being used by people that don't, um, consider themselves musicians um, that don't, you know, there's this weird divide that we've created and it's a very recent thing, you know, that there is this thing and it's only in certain parts of the world that there's, there's this thing called being a musician and it's somehow separate from being a human being. Um, whereas in many societies, the two are synonymous, right? Being a human being is being a musician. Just like you wouldn't say we have walkers and we have talkers. It's like, no, we all walk and we all talk. Right. Um, yeah. Um, some of us talk more than others. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I, I, I hope and that some of the work that we're doing can help to bridge that divide to, um, allow people to, to get outside their head for a second and just be like, Hey, I can do this and I'm making a weird thing and this is fun, you know, and, and this is, this is a cool sound. So some of the work we've been looking at is ways to, focus machine learning models in terms of like multiple players at once. You know, how do we bring people together intermediated by a machine learning model? So, so like these people might not know how to play music together because they're not, you know, quote unquote trained musicians, mm -hmm. but how can we use a machine learning model to augment their abilities in such a way that then the social dynamics that are at the core of what makes music 
um, at least for, for me and my perspective, it's a social thing. And so yeah. being able to have more people have that experience of having this sort of telepathic communication with each other where you're not using any uh, natural language, but all of a sudden you understand what someone else is saying to you and you can respond to that. Like, that's a wonderful thing. And so, um, yeah, so I guess that's sort of my, would be my, if everything worked out, that would be one of the things that I, I would hope that this technology could do because it can also do the other thing, you know, it can, there's a lot of commercial desire for functional music as it were, you know, for just uh, the music as a noun, as opposed to a verb that you supply to a consumer as, and as opposed to enabling people to be producers um, and, you know, consumption of music is, is at an all time high, right? Like we're all, we're all for consuming music, but I, I think we've lost our roots a little bit in terms of producing music ourselves um, you know, and, and the social cultural implications of that. Mm, that's awesome, Jesse. I can't think of a better place to wrap things up. Uh, Great. it was awesome having the opportunity to chat with you. Thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you.